Welcome back to New House Old Soul. How do you build a new house and an old soul when you think about kitchens and cabinets and built-ins and these products, right? Uh, in fact, this may be the most difficult room to kind of create that old soul in a new house because there's so many new products. Original series hosted by Brent Hall, New House, Old Soul, sponsored by Stellar Floors and the Unico System. Little history on kitchens, right? Little history on, on how they used to form. You know, we're doing that Granberry house and we actually have the Sanborn maps and there was a number of outbuildings. I think there was 11 outbuildings at one point. That house is built in 1871 in Texas. I don't think there was a kitchen in that house till probably 1900, 1920. I think that there was an outside kitchen that was part of, you know, how they prepared meals. And so you think about that, it's 150 years ago and even up into the, you know, they didn't have running water coming into their street until like 1905, 1910. The things that make it kitchen work right the the running water that you need to clean things wasn't even there until 1910 so as we think about this we need to realize that the modern kitchen right was a service area for a long time so maybe in the 1960s maybe in the 1970s you begin to have kitchens that become the living room of the house like they are today what was that 50 years ago so the modern kitchen doesn't necessarily evolve and because it's a fairly new thing you know getting it to blend and getting it to work is is a challenge so you know that's 1870s that house and it has an outdoor kitchen and you see you know in the in the north they have the kitchen that would be in the basement at the bottom of the fireplace that's where they cooked their meals then they came up to the main floors no kitchen in the house in the south the kitchen was outside fire and everything else and heat and all those different problems then you get into the the whole you know post civil war and you get into early industrialization and so then you begin to see you know a trickling of technology coming into the house running water electricity modern appliances so that by 1920 1930 the kitchen begins to evolve now realize that in the millwork catalogs in 1900 there really aren't kitchen cabinets in there I and mean, you can look for kitchen cabinets and it might give you a pantry cabinet but they didn't even advertise for the cabinets right and so what was the kitchen at that time it was a work area and it becomes and stays a work area probably into the 1920s and 30s there are catalogs in the 1920s that talk about the workspace, right? The efficiency of the workspace, the efficiency that the kitchens were small. I mean, like the size of my office because you wanted to have as few steps as possible, right? It was a an efficient workspace. It was the way that we might set up a mill shop today or a garage shop where you wanted to be very efficient about, you know, how you move things around and where everything was. By the late 1920s, you begin to have component cabinetry where you, you could buy a lower base or an upper cabinet and things like that. That really changes after the Great Depression going into World War II and the products start changing from inset doors and to plywood doors. So before World War II, it is a workspace. It's small, it's compact. And then after World War II, you know, from 1940 into the 1960s, right? it slowly begins to morph into a more elegant space. You begin to see stained gray cabinets. You begin to see it open up to the family room. You think of the ranch style houses of the 60s. Think of the Brady Bunch, right? And how the kitchen opened up into those other areas of the house. So kitchens are a crazy spectrum. There's a house that we looked at from the 20s and here in Fort Worth that had very small kitchen space. It was still the original space, connected off a back stair, had a Chamberlain cabinets. And so we know that the original kitchen cabinets were changed to a metal cabinet probably in the 50s, but it was still a really small space. There was a swinging door that opened onto an eating area, which, you know, as I looked at the house and what would I do to that house to fix it up, I would probably take down that wall between the kitchen and the breakfast area and let that kitchen expand into those other spaces. And if you remember on the Stav house, we did open that space. In fact, the, the small area that we added, I mean, you walked through that door and it's like a three foot door. Here's that seven, 8,000 square foot house. And there was a three foot, less than three foot wide opening that opened into the kitchen. I mean, talk about being cut off. And the solution we had was to expand that space so that the kitchen could open to the family area and then become 
become an access to the rest of the house. So the old way of building was that the kitchen was a servants area. It was not a family gathering area. And that's something that's really changed. So the, the challenge really to build that new house with an old soul is to infuse into the cabinetry, especially because if you think about a kitchen, 80% of the surface area of the walls is made up of cabinets, right? Maybe 70%, maybe 50%, a majority is made up of cabinets. So if you can get the cabinets right, you're really helping yourself along. You can put in modern appliances, you can have a modern countertop, but cabinets are key. So you really want to infuse that design with things that are historic. If you think about the Pennsylvania farmhouse, in the first episode we went there, we really had a narrative or a story for that house that that piece got added into the 30s or 40s, and we were putting this 30s, 40s kitchen into there. Now, what we did was we had cabinets that went all the way to the ceiling. They were broken up with small cabinets at the top, bigger cabinets at the bottom. We had exposed hinges, those butt hinges, which were used at that time. The color of paint that we used in there, right? Even those rounded shelves that were kind of around the window that are a 40s or 50s deal. We infused a time period, a specific time period, into that house. There's an English house we did in South Carolina years ago that was an English Tudor house, right? We had Tudor paneling. How do you, you know, in the Tudor period, 1500s, right, there was not kitchens like we use them today. So what did we do? We disguised refrigerators with paneled walls. We put all the modern things in there, but gave them a skin of something that was in character of the house. Since we're trying to build furniture, right, I'll show you the subtlety of what's going on when we look at the cabinet. Here's a cabinet door, okay, and a drawer. We build these for clients so we can get a feel for what they're looking at. This is a little English panel mold in here. And look at what's happening down here. And then the feet have that little spandrel cut into them there, right? So we've got a Tudor arch in the, in the foot and we've got a little spandrel cut in, right? So we infused on this job an English detail by this panel mold that we set in place and then by the feet. Now, sometimes the cabinets will have no toe kick, right? That that's really from the 1920s, but I would also consider doing this in oak because it's English, right? And then the English period has those oak things. And so, you know, little subtle things like this can make a big difference. And this one doesn't have exposed hardware, but let me show you how, how much hardware can communicate, right? And so this is, we use these hinges, but each one of these, in my opinion, dates itself, okay? This is unlacquered brass, okay? This is lacquered brass, right? Unlacquered brass means that they didn't spray lacquer on it and my fingerprints and thumbprints age it, okay? And so the reason it looks kind of tarnished, right, is because it's unlacquered brass. Now, unlacquered brass was something that was very popular in the late 1800s, so in the Victorian period, brass is very popular. But you go to the 80s and lacquered brass was the big thing. Everything was lacquered brass and it was bright, shiny brass and it looked tacky. Oil rub bronze, oil rub bronze in the 90s and the early 2000s. All of these things have an age and a date to them. All of these things communicate a certain period. This looks industrial. And then when you add the different finials that you can put on them, right? The ball finial, the acorn finial, the little button finial. You can do all these finials and you can again tell more stories. This is called a cox head hinge, right? and it sits on a door like this. This is a very definitive door type, and if I wanted to do something English, I might make my styles a little bit bigger, but introduce a hinge like that. This is called a rat tail hinge, and you're gonna get the feel for how much variety we can do here, but this goes into your door here, and then this nails onto your cabinet and screws into your cabinet, and that's your hinge, right? Little, little Looks like a little boating flag, but that was very popular as, as an English thing. In the colonial period, this is called an H and L hinge, and because it looks like an H and an L, and it goes right here, and then it nails in right there, and it can give you a colonial revival look. And so, all of these things, if I wanted Victorian, here's a Victorian pull, right? But you know, because of that beading and everything else, the detailing on there, that it looks Victorian. I wanna take you over to the Georgian house we did a few years ago, where we really have a hierarchy of cabinetry from furniture-esque built-ins to kitchen cabinets to lower and secondary cabinets that you know have no exposed hinges, other ones that have exposed hinges, but all trying to communicate this classical Georgian feel in our millwork.
there's a number of decisions that you make when you're when you're building cabinets overlay doors inset doors exposed hardware all those different things and as we talked about hardware is a very definitive piece of historic cabinets where does all this come from as a reminder it comes from furniture right that the furniture was the pieces that's where you know built-in cabinetry started right they didn't start with cabinetry cabinetry was always copying furniture and so when we were building this piece here right to, to look like a antique cupboard right we built the the entablature above right we put trim onto our cabinets okay that communicated to be more of a piece of furniture but look at the look at the hinges right now I know you guys will I get pushed back, but the butt hinges, okay, and it's particularly this style of butt hinge is really important because it communicates that age and history and tradition. Look, the pushback I get on, on butt hinges is like, oh, what if the house moves? What if the, what if the thing? Well, we've been building cabinets for hundreds of years, okay? Things always move. There are ways to adjust cabinet doors so that they still fit right. And so if your cabinet guy is giving you the thing, well, I'm not gonna be able to go adjust that. I'm gonna not gonna tell him warranty. Fine, I'll go find someone else who wants to help me out and build this thing. There are adjustable butt hinges. Amarok makes some. Um, I don't like them as well. They're kind of too small. But this traditional butt hinge, I think is really communicative of an older piece, an historic piece. And this is what I find in historic houses, the ball finial. That's why we really wanted it on our cabinets. Now, if you look over here onto a secondary cabinet, right? Notice there is no hinges here, right? These are done with the European hinge, right? So there's a, there's a balance in the dial. As you move around the house, it is a way of creating hierarchy. None of these cabinets in this house are overlay cabinet doors, right? Because that, communicates a post-1950, as I explained, a European-styled uh, thing that isn't appropriate, that isn't traditional. So historic cabinets, to get that historic look, the inset doors, making it look as much like a piece of furniture, whether it's the trim that you put on, the pedestal, you know, the different ways of building it, you can still build your boxes, but you've got to have the trim right so it communicates the right story. The last piece of that hierarchy is really when we're trying to imply that we're building furniture and look at these hinges. These are the olive hinge, okay? And they are a very unique, wonderful type of hinge, uh, actually a lift-off type of hinge that has a great architectural tradition. So here is our three levels of hierarchy, right? We've got the olive hinges on the near pieces of furniture, the butt hinges in the kitchen, and then the European hinges with inset doors. All things that very subtly help us move that thing around to help communicate, you know, age, tradition, history, narrative, right? All of those things are happening because of the hardware that we've used, the way we've built these cabinets, and the story that it helps to deliver. Okay guys, I just wanted to you know, stop in at Thistle Hill and show you kind of the, some of the things we've learned and show you the subtle difference between new and old cabinet and what's going on. For instance, these are original historic cabinets, okay? Now, <laughs> the interesting thing is that these are not the original doors for these cabinets. How do I know? I'll show you in a second. These are original doors and this is original hardware, okay? So we've got original hardware down here that opens and closes these doors. And look at the detail here on this back panel. So this is one of those cabinets that would have shown up in a catalog. It's oak, it's not paint grade. Most of the cabinets that would have been in the kitchen are paint grade. This would have been a butler's pantry going into the dining room. But there is a bracket here. There is this, there is the, there was something that sat here, you can see it's been taken away. And look at this detail over here. We've got this bracket, this pretty little bracket that's supporting this. Notice it's falling down right here that we got a crack right here in, in this thing. So this probably has fallen over time because there was a bracket in here. It probably looked exactly like this bracket here. And you know, up underneath here, you can see some nail holes and things like that where that kind of thing was. So, but the thing I want you to see is look at all the kind of intricate detail that's, that's in that's, that's, that's just in, in this area, which is typical of historic cabinets. We've got a pretty little bracket. We've got a little uh, cove molding that goes around here. There was a foot. You can see it on the other side that sat here. There was a panel detail. Look at this subtle little panel in between here. The X is in the little freeze there, the size of that crown, how it's incorporated, 
All of these things are clues that we should, as we think about a new kitchen, we think about. So these hinges are like, hmm, that would be an exposed butt hinge like that. That's really interesting. Look at this little catch, but it, we, we can still get these catches. That's really interesting. The fact that they're slotted head and screws instead of Phillips head screws is a clue. There's all of these clues that tell you that it's old. The main thing that's old, and the reason why I know that this door is not original, is that all of this wood, all of this wood is quarter sawn white oak, okay? So see these little grain patterns in here? That's what happens when you quarter sawn oak, it actually gets these ray patterns in here. And so all of this stuff is quarter sawn oak. This is plain sawn, okay? So this is not original. Now, uh, same thing goes over here. Now look what happens down here, okay? This, all of a sudden the hardware changes. This hardware, okay, there's a, a kind of a butt hinge by Amarok that is meant to be an adjustable butt hinge, okay? This is a non-adjustable butt hinge. This is an adjustable butt hinge, it's new. Look at the cut and the grain of this wood. It's all plain sawn, okay? So I know this is not original. I know this is, I and mean, then I'm just looking at grain quality. But when we go over there and look at these new cabinets, I'm gonna show you the difference that's happening here and the subtle things that you're gonna do as you get to that, you know, historic cabinet feel into your house. Okay, so we are in the original kitchen space, okay, but not the original kitchen. How do I know? I know that these aren't original cabinets because all of this wood is, is plain sawn oak, okay? The plain sawn oak is really an ugly oak that they never would have done at the turn of the century. And so I don't like these pulls. These pulls are a, are a new pull. It looks like colonial revival pull. And so it, it get, we get into the details. Look how they did this crown. Look how large that crown is. That crown goes into a room that's the size of a scale of a room that would go in a, a 12 foot tall room at the ceiling level. At a cabinet level, it's entirely too big. Look at the, look at the little cap on the door right there, right? The cap on that door is this big. You know, this thing is three times as large as the other moldings that are in here that give you a sense of scale. So we know that, the, you know, little things like that. I, I hope you see the things that I'm picking out, the things I'm picking up on. I also look at the look at the floor tile. We got a 12 by 12 porcelain tile. Never would have been here. And so th there are, you know, all of these clues going on in this house that help me, you know, date it and age it and, and know that it's later. Now, Kitchens are notoriously a place that you want to update and you want to redo, but this kitchen could have been made so much better by having authentic period cabinets that went all the way to the ceiling, possibly areas for china storage and things like that. This would have been a functional area as well as a paint grade area as well. They never would have spent stain grade woods in this area, and if it was stain grade, it would have dropped down to pine. Look what they did around these doors pine okay it's not oak so if they were going to stain grade this area it would have been a cheaper wood not an oak wood this was a servants area this wasn't an area where your guests came so they never would have done that so point being there's all these layers and details and each one is is a two percent here two percent there two but you get you know 10 of those put together and you've changed it 20 percent and so the cabinets as a whole end up you know making up you know, here in this kitchen, there are 50% of the walls in this kitchen, right? So if I can get the cabinets right, I've got 50% of the kitchen right. Just be thinking about that as you're trying to infuse this old soul. It's a bunch of small details, but also getting important details like this right. Talking with Wind Supply here in Delta. You know, in this whole series, we've been trying to build a narrative and a story, and that old soul is kind of the magic, the secret sauce for a new house. And so we're talking with Amy, she's with Wind Supply, talking about these plumbing fixtures and the narrative of them and why they're so appropriate for these houses. Tell us what you've got here. We, th these are really handsome looking. They, they look like they have a clear story. What do we got? We have the Delta Broderick here, and it's really great because it has an industrial farmhouse look. And they really thought about a lot of the details here, you know, with the little nut here to really add that industrial look. This is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about when I want a narrative. Like, I want something with character. Too often it feels like the uh, hardware plumbing supplies just are muddy Xeroxes of Xeroxes of Xeroxes. And to have things like this that tell a story is really important. It seems like sometimes the homeowner gets sent into the, the showroom store, you know, they see all that's going on in your place and they're like, you know, their eyes glaze over. 
you help them through that process? Is that what happens? I sure do. So a lot of people don't think about plumbing fixtures a lot. That's not something you think about every day. So when you walk into a showroom like our wind supply showroom, you're pretty overwhelmed. There's so much to look at. You don't know where to start, and that's where I come in. I really like to be that guide for them. And you know, they come in with a design style. I can take them to that specific design style that they're looking for. That's really a huge help because a lot of salespeople in the showroom don't know, and they're just like, well, the hardware's over there, or the plumbing, you know, and if they don't have someone professional, it can end up with ugly houses, houses that have no soul, right? So could I get this at a big box store? You cannot get these at a big box store. These are trade exclusive, so only our professionals can get these at a professional plumbing supply store like Wind Supply. So your role, right? You maybe the quarterback or something on this process? You got plumber, homeowner, builder. What is your role exactly? What are you doing? I kind of bring it all together. I steer the products to the right people. So, you know, my plumbers are going to want their rough in valves and my designers are going to want to know the fixtures. My contractors are just going to know everything. What's When's going it going to be there? When's it going to be here? When's the arrival time? So I, I really do quarterback all of that. Are you everywhere in the country? I mean, you know, where are wind supplies? Wind supplies are located strategically throughout the U.S. We have 660 stores. Wow, a lot of stores and distribution centers, we have, hopefully. We're working towards, we have seven distribution centers. Okay, and supply is not a problem right now? Supply is definitely not a problem. We are keeping up with the demand of our customers. Okay, guys, so if you're interested in wind supply, what do they do? How do they find you? We do have a website provided that you can find your local wind supply. All right, well, for great narrative providing pieces like this from Delta and Wind Supply, check them out.